Hi everybody, this is Math024, and this is Module 4, Part 2, so video Part 2. Now here we're going to create functions and then also um, evaluate and interpret functions. So for our first problem, we have a furniture salesman that makes a weekly rate of $300 plus $45 commission for each piece of furniture he sells. So we're going to let X represent the pieces of furniture he sells per week. Um, so basically they want us to create a function or a math problem to represent his pay for each week. Now, there are two variables or two things that we know. Um, one, he has a weekly rate of $300 and then he gets a commission of $45 for each piece of furniture he sells. And X is going to be the number of pieces per week. So for P of X, when we write our problem, I always want to think like, what is always constant there? And every week he's going to get a salary or a weekly rate of $300. So that's his pay. But, um, you know, in order to encourage them to sell, he's also going to get a commission. So he's going to add on to that for each piece of furniture he sells. So, um, you know, if he sells X pieces, it would be 45 times x or 45x. We don't really need the parentheses there, so I'm going to erase that and just put the x. So this would be p of x. Um, so that would be represent his pay for the week. Now they want to know what's the domain of p of x. So like what are the x values we can put in this? And x represents the pieces of furniture he sells per week. Well, you know, I know if I was selling things, I'm never going to sell like negative five pieces of furniture, negative four pieces of furniture. Um, I am going to sell, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six pieces or zero pieces. Um, I'm not going to sell two and a half pieces of furniture. So my domain here, I really think the, the set of numbers that would be best would be whole numbers. Okay, because we don't want any negative numbers and we're not going to do like, um, you know, half of a piece of furniture. So the last thing they want us to do is to evaluate and interpret P of 7. So we're going to do P of 7, which means, you know, we're going to take our 300 plus 45 times 7. So instead of X, we're going to put 7 in there. And 45 times 7 is 315 plus our 300. So P of 7 is equal to 615. And they want us to interpret this. What does this mean? So we're finding out the salesman's weekly salary. So if they sell seven pieces of furniture, their weekly salary is going to be $615 for the week. Okay, so next we have a train departs and must travel 630 miles to reach its destination. It is traveling towards the destination at a constant rate of 90 miles per hour. Let T represent the hours that the train has traveled from where it departs. So create a function called D of T. So we're going to do D of T. That represents the distance the train is from its destination. So the train departs a station and it must travel 630 miles to reach its destination. And we want to create a function that represents the distance the train is from the destination. Um, we know that T is the number of hours that it's traveling and it's going 90 miles per hour. So again, we're looking for our constant and it's starting really at 630 miles away from its destination. So think, as the train travels, it's going to get closer to its destination. So, um, you know, we know it goes 90 miles per hour, and as it travels, it's going to get closer. So I'm going to take the 630, and then I'm going to subtract, and next I'm going to do it's 90 miles per hour, but T represents the number of hours, so it'll be 90T. So for every hour that it travels, it travels 90 miles and it gets closer to that destination. So that would be our um, equation here. So we're going to start off and we're going to do D of 4 to start. So we're going to do 630 minus 90 times 4. And we know 90 times 4 is 360. So 630 
minus 360 is 270. So after four hours, because T represents the number of hours, the train is 270 miles from the destination. All right, now they want us to do D of 12. Does it make sense and what does it mean? So now when we do D of 12, we're going to substitute 12 in for T. We'll do 630 minus 90 times 12. And 90 times 12 is 1080. So if I do 630, minus 1080, I end up with negative 450. Now, for our situation, does that make sense? If we're traveling to our destination, what is our mileage when we get to that destination? It should be zero. We're zero miles away from that destination. If it's negative 450, that means I've gone too far. So while D of 12 can be evaluated, it doesn't make sense for our situation in this problem. So it does not make sense. We can't use that. Let's try D of 7. And that is going to give us, so 90, we'll do 630 minus 90 times 7. So 90 times 7 is 630. So now we have 630 minus 630, or we get to 0. So it's 0 miles from the destination. So what does this mean here? And really D of seven, it does make sense. What it means is it takes seven hours to travel to our destination. We're zero miles from the destination. So that means we've made it, we are at our destination. Now E asks again for the domain, what kind of numbers can we put in for T? T represents time. Um, now we only put in whole numbers, but when we're talking about time, um, we're not going to talk about negative time. So we don't want negative numbers. We're not going to say negative two hours, um, but we will talk about, like we could say two and a half hours, three and a half hours. Um, we can throw in those decimals. So I would say for my domain um, that we would do positive, because I don't want negative, but we could do positive real numbers because that will include like two and a half, three and three fourths, um, you know, 2.5, 3.5 hours, because we can talk in decimals when we talk about time. All right, so here, the average height of a six-year-old boy is 48 inches. The average height of boys between the ages of six and 11 changes constantly. On average, the height changes two and a half inches per year. Let T be the time in years. So now first, they want us to create the function h of t, h standing for the height, t standing for the time in years, that represents the height in inches of a boy t years past age six. So um, we're gonna start off, when we write our equation, we know the average height of a boy that's six years old is 48 inches. So we're gonna start at 48. And we know that they are growing. So we're gonna to add to those 48 inches. We're not gonna subtract. And it's on average, they grow about two and a half inches per year. And T is the time in years. So we would do 48 plus our average rate of growth, which is 2.5 inches per year or 2.5 times T. Okay, so now they wanna know the domain of T. Um, and again, with this, honestly, um, we weren't going to talk about negative years because we're not going to, you know, when they're negative two, they're not born, so they're not there. So we don't want negative numbers, but I could say like two and a half years, three and a half years. So I could throw in some decimals or fractions. So again, I think a good domain here would be positive real numbers. Okay. Now, we need to interpret and evaluate h of 3. Now, remember, time is um, t, and it is the height of the boy t years past age 6. So if it's 
age of three, that means it's three years past the age of six or a nine-year-old. So we would have 48 plus 2.5 times three. So 2.5 times three is 7.5. So we have 48 plus 7.5, and we are going to end up with 55.5 inches. So on average, a nine-year-old boy should be about 55.5 inches. Now let's do H of 100. So 100 years past six. So that means that they're going to be 106. That's pretty old. Let's try it out though. We're going to 48 plus 2.5 times 100. So we have 48 plus 250 if we do times 2.5 times 100. So that's going to give us what? 398 inches. All right. Now, does this make sense? One, think about the growth rate of, of any person. They don't grow forever, and we don't always grow at the same rate per year. So, you know, we're not going to grow two and a half inches every year until, um, you know, we're 106. Um, so in this situation, that age of 100, even though we can evaluate it and find an answer, it doesn't make sense for our situation. We're really looking at the average growth rate between six and 11. So, you know, we couldn't add 100 to it. It would be way too much. Um, so it just I mean, people aren't 398 inches tall. So it really just doesn't make sense for the problem. All right. And so here we have, we've been given the function and now we are going to interpret. So our function for, um, what we're going to look at is P of A equals one hundredth times a squared minus 5.1 times a plus 370. And this gives the percent chance that a 60 year old male who smokes cigarettes will survive to age a, so whatever the age is. So um, the first thing they want us to do is to, what is the percent chance that a 60 year old male who smokes cigarettes will live to the age of 81? So what we're going to do here is A is the age. So we're going to substitute in 81 for A and solve the equation. So we're going to do P of 81. And that will give us 100 times 81 squared minus 5.1 times 81 plus 370. Um, when we square 81, we end up with 6,561. And then if I times that 0 0.01, we end up with 65.81 minus um, 5.1 times 81 is 413.1. Plus our 370. So when I add all of that together, um, I end up with 22.51. And again, my answer is the percent chance that a 60 year old male that smokes um, will live to 81. So if a 60 year old male smokes, they have a 22.51, <coughs> excuse me, percent chance that they will live to 81. Um, let's interpret P of 62. So now our age is 62. So we're going to do 0 0.01 times 62 squared um, minus 5.1 times 62 plus 370. So we do 62 squared and I get 3,844 times 0 0.01, so it gives me 38.44 minus 5.1 times 62 is 316.2 plus 370, so when I add them all together, um, I end up with 92 
0.24, and again, that will be the percentage. So if there's 62, um, or if there's 60 and they smoke, they have a 92.24% chance of living to 62. So that does make sense. It seems like it's very reasonable. Um, all right, our last one is P of 55. So we're going to do P of 55. So I will do 0 0.01 times 55 squared minus 5.1 times 55 plus 370. So 55 squared is 3,025 times 0 0.01 gives me 30. 0.25 minus 5.1 times 55 is 280.5 plus 370. So when I add it all together, I end up with 119.75%. So does this make sense for our problem? And really, if you're looking at it, the formula we're given is the percent chance that a 60-year-old male who smokes will survive to age A. Um, P of 55 means our age is 55, which is under 60. Um, so it's really not going to work for a number less than 60. It has to be greater than 60 in order to make sense. Um, because, of course, if they're 55 and they're talking about a 60-year-old male, they're going to live. So... Next, we have the function v of m equals 200m divided by m squared plus 100. And this gives the number of DVDs sold for a particular movie in thousands m months after the movie has been released. So um, the first question is how many DVDs are sold four months after it has been released? So m is the number of months. So we're going to do v of 4. And that will be 200 times 4 divided by 4 squared plus 100. So 200 times 4 will give me 800. Um, over 4 squared is 16. 16 plus 100 is 116. And then when I do the division, 800 divided by 116 is, um, and I'm going to round it. So it's going to be approximately um, 6.9, because I get 6.896, so it'll be 6.9, and this is thousands of movies, so 6.9 thousand, or in thousands of movies, so thousands of movies sold, 6.9 thousands of movies sold, I'm not saying that correctly, I don't think, but. all right. Let's take a look at V of 10 next. So now we're going to do 200 times 10 um, times 10 squared, divided by 10 squared plus 100. So 200 times 10 is going to give me 2,000. And then 10 squared is 100. 100 plus 100 is 200. So 2,000 divided by 200 is going to give me 10. So 10,000 movies have been sold 10 months after the movie was released. The DVD was released. All right, and our last one we're going to do is V of negative 5. Now I want you to think about this before we even do the problem. Um, what do you think? Is it going to make sense? M is the number of months after the movie has been released. So if I do, if I plug in the negative 5, I can get an answer, but does it make sense? So we're going to do 200 times negative 5 over negative 5 squared plus 100. So 200 times negative 5 is negative 1,000. Negative 5 squared is 25. 25 plus 100 is 125. So then if I divide negative 1,000 by 125, I get negative 8. Now again, our answer is giving us the number of movies in thousands sold after the movie has been released. Can you have negative, can you sell negative 8,000 movies? 
No. So the negative 5 really represents 5 months before the DVD even comes out. So for this problem, it, negative 5 is not um, a value that would be in the domain. It would not work. So even though we get an answer, it doesn't make sense for this problem. All right, our next one that we are going to look at is now we are looking at um, the function h of t equals negative 16 t squared plus 1,156. Um, and this is a neglecting air resistance, but this gives the height of an object in feet at time t in seconds after the object was dropped from the top of a skyscraper. What is the height of the object? two seconds after it was dropped from the top of the skyscraper. So remember, t is our time in seconds. So here, t is going to equal two. So they want to know what's the height of the object after it was dropped from the skyscraper. So we're going to find h of two, and that is going to give us negative 16 times two squared plus 1,156. That negative 16 is going to deal with the gravity's pull on Earth. So negative or two squared is four. So negative 16 times four is going to give me negative 64 plus 1,156. Um, and that is going to equal, let's see here, 1,992 and it will be um, feet. So two seconds after the object is dropped off the building it is 1,000. 92 feet from the ground. Next, we are going to evaluate um, and interpret h of 10. So we're going to do h of 10, which means we'll do negative 16 times 10 squared plus 1,156. So I know 10 squared is 100. Negative 16 times 100 is negative 1,600. Oops, that's 1,600, plus 1,156. Um, so if we add that, we end up with negative 444. Now, does that make sense? T is in time in seconds. So after 10 seconds, after we drop the object, it is negative 444 feet from the skyscraper. Now, I want you to think, um, when the object hits the ground, what's the height of the object? Hopefully you're shouting at me, you're saying it's zero. That's ground level, it would be zero. If it's negative 444 feet, it went way down on the earth, which doesn't happen. In this case, it's not happening. It's not what we're accounting for. So um, it doesn't take 10 seconds for the object to fall to the earth. So this, in this case, the time is too large, so it really doesn't make sense for our problem. All right, let's try our last one, h of 8.5. So we'll do negative 16 times 8.5 squared plus 1,156. So 8.5 squared is 72.25 times negative 16 gives me negative 1,156. And when I add 1,156, I'm going to get zero. So does this make sense? Why or why not? And again, think back to what I just said. When we throw an object off of a skyscraper, when it hits the ground, it will be zero, zero feet um, from the ground. So in this case, with the 8.5, we've found that it takes 8.5 seconds for the object to hit the ground because once it hits zero, it is lying on the ground. All right, now we are going to look at a piecewise function um, and interpret that given the information that we have. So a shipping company charges a different price per parcel based upon the number of parcels being shipped at a time. Um, the following function, p of x, gives the total cost for shipping x items. So if you have between, it looks like between one and five items, it costs $2 per item. If you have between five and 10 items, it's $1.90. $1.80 per item if it's between 10 and 15. $1.70 if it's between 15 and 20. And then if it's greater than 20 or equal to 20, $1.60 per item. 
So here, they want to know the domain of P of X. And again, X is the number of items you're shipping. So, you know, we're not going to ship negative amounts of items. We're not going to ship negative two items. Um, we're not going to ship like half of an item. So it's either going to be counted as one or two or three, but not like two and a half items. So here, I would say your domain would be um, whole numbered or positive whole numbers. Or just really whole numbers. You could put whole numbers in there. Okay. Um, and you wouldn't ship zero items, so really like one and above. Um, use the above function to find the total cost for shipping 13 items. So 13 would fall right here between the 10 and the 15. So it's going to be a dollar 80. We're going to do P of 13. It's going to be a dollar 80 times 13. So a dollar eighty times thirteen is going to cost twenty three dollars and forty cents. All right, and then for C, um, evaluate and interpret P of thirty seven. So we know that thirty seven is the number of items we're shipping, um, and any items greater than twenty, it's going to cost a dollar sixty per item. So we would do a dollar sixty times 37 and when we do the math that is going to give us it's going to cost $59.20 to ship 37 items. All right so we have our last problem here for this module and here we have a baseball team to decides to determine player salaries based upon the number of home runs the player hit in the previous year. The function, following function, S of H, represents the salary in hundreds of thousands of dollars um, of a major league baseball, of a major league baseball that hit H home, run, H home runs in the previous year. So, um, if we look at this, if they hit between zero and ten home runs, um, the equation for finding their salary would be 4.84 times 2,500 H. Um, if they were between 10 and under 20, it was 4.84 times 1.5 H. And you can go on and see here. So H represents um, the salary. Or excuse me, H represents the home runs hit in the previous year. So the domain here, if we're looking at home runs, um, you always start at zero, so we don't need any negative numbers there. Um, you can't hit one and a half home runs. You either hit a home run or you don't. So I would say for my domain, um, it again would be whole numbers or like zero, you know, to infinity if I wanted to write it in interval notation. You guys recall that interval notation from the past. Um, okay, now use the function above to find the salary of a player who hit 16 home runs in the previous year. So let's see here. 16 would come right in here. So I am going to do 4.84 plus 1.5 times 16. So 1.5 times 16 is 24. So we have 4.84 plus 24, and that is going to give us 28.84, and that's in hundreds of thousands of dollars. So 28.84 hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's a lot of money. 28. Um. All right. Evaluate and interpret S of 30. So now they hit 30 home runs. So this one wouldn't work because it's less than 30. So we're going to go down here. So it's going to be 4.84 plus um, 3 times our 30 or 3.00, but it's the same as 3. So 3 times 30 is 90. So we have 4.84 plus 
90, and this is S of 30. So that is going to equal um, 94.84 hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. All right, our last one, I'm going to move it up here, S of zero. So if it's zero, it means they got no home runs. So they're going to do 4.84 plus 0.25 times zero. And anything times zero is zero, so we're going to end up with 4.84 in hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, does this make sense? What does it mean? Um, it does make sense. Um, you know, sometimes, um, like in the American League, the pitchers don't hit. They don't have at-bats, so they would not get necessarily home runs. Um, so, you know, if you base it off of the number of home runs, then they didn't get any home runs. Or they didn't play a lot. They were injured. So, you know, if they're calculating their pay, um, it's potential that they did not get any home runs. So it does make sense. All right, and that is it for our video for the second half of module four. Have a great day, guys.